Good evening, and welcome to Just a Little Bit. The West Side Gazette continues to be on the front forefront to talk about how do we get past the pandemic? How do we deal with the crisis of this black-on-black -black crime? There's a very interesting article in the paper that speaks to that. Uh, it's political season. Things are heating up. The politicians are out, as well as the politicians, uh, defacing other candidates' signs and not understanding how significant black businesses are when it comes to their campaign dollars. So we got to learn to do what we do with each other to get where we need to be. Oh, 40 on the 40, 40 seconds of the history of faith, strength, and endurance of black people. Have you ever wondered how fire poles came into firehouses? Well, there was a brother by the name of David Keaton. He was from Company 21, an all-black firehouse in Chicago. David thought, well, man, we can get from the top floor down to the buggies quicker if we didn't use that spiral staircase. That's how we got it. Well, welcome back to Just a Little Bit. And I am so proud to be able to have uh, this young person uh, on this segment of the program growing our voices. And yakety yak, when you talk to the youth, they talk back. We have a miracle child here, uh, one in the great ability and her her wisdom at such a young age. Uh, Miss Jada Washington. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Good evening. And how are you? I'm great. How about you? I'm terrific and getting better. To whom am I speaking with? You're speaking to Jada Washington Booth. Oh, Miss Jada Washington Booth. What is that outfit you have on there? This is a NASA astronaut. Um, this is an astronaut, astronaut um, suit that we received from Huntsville, Alabama at the space program. Wait a minute. Hold up. Now, you got to explain this to me. <laughs> That's a NASA astronautical uh, a suit that you received where? At Huntsville, Alabama. Huntsville, Alabama. Is that the space program? Yes. How did you get to Huntsville, Alabama? Well, we had to go. Um, we had a road trip there, and I received a scholarship. A scholarship from whom? From um, the the space program. Wow, I'm I'm sitting here look, looking at a lot of your accolades, and one of the main things I see is that this is the principal of the honor roll. Yes. Wow, how did you achieve this? Um, well, hard work pays off, especially when I study. So that's how I achieved um, straight A's. Wow, wow. Now tell me a little bit about that that space program. So at the space program, we've learned. Um, a lot of the physics that they've learned and um, what it took for them to get to space and all of the missions that they've accomplished. Mm -hmm. And we also did some of the um, missions that they actually are going to do in the future. Wait a minute. Hold on. I'm, I'm just a little country boy. You did what? Yeah. You performed some of the, the mission activities? Yes. Wow. Tell me one of the ones that you really enjoyed. Um. Well... In about 2030 or before then, they're going to make their way to Mars. And we were able to do one of the Mars programs that they were going to achieve. Wait a minute. Did you see any little men up there on Mars? <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. I I'm looking at some of your, your patches here. Mm -hmm. um, oh, you want to tell me about this one? Um, That one, mm -hmm. I think it was received by one of the astronauts mm -hmm. or one of the missions that they've completed. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what patch exactly that one is. Okay, though. okay, that's fine. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to stick you in anything like that. <laughs> I'm just so impressed that the fact that I'm sitting here talking to uh, a future astronaut. Uh, what, what about hidden figures? You know anything about hidden figures? Um, yes, I've watched the movie numerous times. Uh -huh. And um, I've also learned about what the three ladies and hidden figures have done mm -hmm. for NASA. Mm -hmm. You know, this is ironic. Um, um, one of the, the, the ladies uh, is, is I'm, I'm, we're on the same bloodline. We have a relationship. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me which one. I can't remember. But when I talked to my, my great aunt, she told me about it. Yeah. So let, let me ask you another question. Um, if you had an opportunity or, or, or if, you could, if you could say something to, to uh, interest youth your age or younger, what would you tell them? Um, they should most definitely 
be able to connect with the community and people of their age that have similar interests mm -hmm. and not to always be indoors and like get to socialize. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a gentleman by the name of Vincent Jones Jr. wrote an article about you this week and it's in the Westside Gazette newspaper. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, so I, I, I know a little bit about you, but I'm not gonna spoil it for the, for the readers. I, I'm, just, I'm just so elated to meet you and you, you mentioned the fact that the community, okay, so how, is, how important is it to be involved in the community? It's very important to be involved in the community, especially if you want to be a role model for those that do not have a role model to look up to, it's very important. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things that you do in the community, Ms. Well, Washington Booth? <laughs> well, I, um, I also do, um, community service hours. I like to give back to the community. And one of the um, one of the programs I do is Dare to Care. It's with my church. Mm -hmm. And we give back, especially during Thanksgiving, to families in need um, of Thanksgiving foods. And we also um, we um, give it to them for free so they can have a free meal with their family and enjoy Thanksgiving. Wow. And tell me one of your most proudest moments and achievement um definitely um when i went to space camp like i was so excited when i found out about the scholarship because mm -hmm. the first time that i did it i wasn't picked and then um i tried again and at first i was like very down and i was like i'm not sure i want to do this again but um people kept on pushing me to go forward and that's how i received the scholarship so I think that's one of the most um, important tasks that I have done in my life. Wow, congratulations. I am so proud of you. And I know you, your mother and your father, I know they are. You know, yes. you are an exceptional person. So please don't take your talents uh, for granted. You know, the fact that you're willing to give back and you're doing that, Jaden, that means a whole lot. And the fact that you mentioned something that really tugged at my heart, your church. Yes. You know, we can't do nothing without God. Mm -hmm. So congratulations to you. Thank and my you. prayers are that you get a chance to fly as high as you want to and look back at us and tell us to come on up. <laughs> Is that cool? You. Yes. Thank you so very much. Thank you. All righty. Welcome back. Again, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure to understand and appreciate our history. And today we have for the San, Sankofa moment, uh, where we get a chance to go back and bring some of our history and hope up to the future. We have uh, joining us on this segment, uh, a longtime resident and a historian of this area, uh, Mr. Vern Doolin. Would you come up and join us, Mr. Doolin? Mr. How are you, sir? I'm doing come real on. good, man. Yourself today? I'm terrific and getting better. Yes, sir. Mr. Doolin, I know you are a collector of things. I've been a, benef a benefactor of those things. What? What, what got you involved with collecting? I was always interested in, in, uh, in our past, things that happened, mm -hmm. things that existed. But I'm going to tell you the truth why I really got started okay. into it. Mm -hmm. I always liked to dress. Mm -hmm. So I always used to go out and look for the old garbadine suits from the 1940s. Mm -hmm. And I liked the way they dressed at that time. And it went from the garbadine suits to the uh, hand painted ties that they mm -hmm. made. It went from that to antique watches. So it just made it a common thing mm -hmm. to tie history into that because there was so much history behind that. You know, and that's how I really got started. To and, be and, honest. and I and I've um, not remembering the things mm -hmm. that, that 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 you have done in in those in those in the lines of, of the historical things of collecting mm -hmm. and the clothes and mm -hmm. how debonair you know that you dress and all. And I forgot about that. But man, I'm looking here and I'm holding something. Uh, your mother's voter's registration card. Right. 1958. 1958. She was 24 years old at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. and if mm -hmm. you notice, she was a housewife. I see, man. I, she didn't. She, your daddy took care of her. <laughs> right. And, and, right. and don't make me assume, but this picture I'm holding, right. uh, it says Everyday Fruit Stand. You right. want to tell us something about this? Everyday mm -hmm. Fruit Stand was founded by my grandfather, Will Walker. Mm -hmm. And Will Walker couldn't, what we used to say in the old days, he couldn't read them or wrote them. Mm. He couldn't even write his name but he had an entrepreneurship heart. Uh, Mr. Walker, my grandfather worked for uh, 
Mm -hmm. He worked for the first mayor of Wilton Manors, who mm -hmm. owned a fertilizer company. He went to them and told them that he wanted to start his own business. Mm -hmm. So they gave my grandfather some land, which we now call Carl Springs. My granddaddy had a farm, and all of the people who lived in the neighborhood were able to work with my grandfather. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, why don't I take my product and bring it back to town so I can you know, have that product available for the residents? Mm -hmm. You know, back in those days, your, your word was your bond. Your, your word was everything, so right. people got everything on credit. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would come to my grandfather's store, fresh fruits and vegetables, Lily Dillies, mm -hmm. two for a penny cookies. Vern, where, where was this store located? Right here, 1012 Northwest 6th Street. Mm -hmm. So you were born and bred in this area? Right, right here, right here. On, I remember when 6th Street was a two-lane highway. Mm -hmm. I remember when funerals passed by, you, if you were walking, you stood still mm -hmm. out of respect for the dead passing by. Mm. When people got married, they rode through the neighborhood with cans on the back of their car. And wait. I remember all of those mm -hmm. things as a little child growing up. You know, I remember going to the Victory Theater. The Victory on Theater. On the weekend, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, to, to see a movie. I think the last movie I saw was Shaft. And after that, they closed the theater down wow, and it became man. a church. So you are truly a product of the 33311. Yes, I am. So that, that to you, uh, it's not a novelty. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. It was a way of life. Okay. And that life consisted of what? Simple things, Bobby. Mm -hmm. Going to church, that, mm -hmm. as you mentioned earlier, you know, we, we all went to St. John United Methodist Church, mm -hmm. which is one of the oldest churches in Broward County. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, that church was founded in 1904. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we went to uh, Reverend C.R. Banks, who was one of the first Boy Scout leaders here in Broward County, was our pastor. His mm -hmm. wife was Miss Rosine, Rowena Banks. Mm -hmm. who was our uh, musician at the time. You know, my father sang in the choir, you, you know. <laughs> Vern, you know, you, you, keep a lot, you keep a lot of stuff hidden, man. <laughs> what else you gonna surprise me with? Well, Bob, it's just, mm -hmm. just, you know, it's just, like you and I say, it's just things that we know and mm -hmm. I don't go out and flaunt it. I just kind of talk about it when I have a feeling. Mm -hmm. I feel. Like from time to time I send you guys pictures because yeah. I get a feeling and I said, I want to share this, mm -hmm. you know, so people can see. You know, it's funny, my grandfather sent three, three of his sons to college. Mm -hmm. You know, going back to what I said, he couldn't read or write his name. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But he made it his business to send them to college. They all went to Morehouse. By the fact, Dr. Walker, who was one of the first physicians in this area, uh, graduated, got his doctor's degree from Howard University, mm -hmm. came back here, and he was one of the few doctors that you could go to, even if you couldn't pay him, he will still see you. Wow, I'm holding uh, uh, a plaque here, uh, and this plaque is, is, is almost as old as I am, and it's, it's, a, it's an award from the, uh, that other fraternity. Yeah. Say their name, Bobby. <laughs> uh, uh, Alpha Phi Alpha uh, Fraternity, and it's an award presented in recognition to the family having done most in adhering to the Alpha theme, finishing high school, go to college, Will Walker, Mary E. Walker. Wow, bro, this yes. is this is this is this is yes. unique, man. Yes. Um, okay, so I and, and I'm I'm just uh, I marveled at uh, I marveled at the uh, information that you have that you that you don't want to share. Tell us a little bit more about this area, bro. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I mean, what do you remember most as a kid growing up here, man? You know. A few things I remember. Mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. every Christmas, uh, Mr. Sweeting mm -hmm. would be on a fire department, would, would take him through the neighborhood and he would throw candy out to the kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember uh, as a child growing up, uh, it was always important that we, 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 we bought a gift for our mothers during Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. So we would go out and hustle bottles walk through the neighborhood, pick up bottles, clean them out. You know, some of them had tobacco and stuff in them. Yeah. We would clean those bottles. Well, what, kind of bottles man? So, what kind of bottles are you talking about? Well, they were knee-high bottles. Mm -hmm. They were Coca-Cola bottles. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we would go out and hustle the bottles and bring them back and get paid. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of my first Mother's Day cards that I bought my mom, I, I, I hustled up a, uh, a dollar worth of bottles. Mm -hmm. And that's a penny a bottle you got. 
So do you so. still have that Mother's Day card burn? You got everything else now. I might have. <laughs> I actually got my sixth birthday card that mm -hmm. my mother gave me. Mm -hmm. I got a whole book collection of cards that were given out to my mother and to us as mm -hmm. kids when we were growing up. It's probably 100 cards in there, dating all the way back to the 50s. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so Vern, if you, if you could uh, 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 offer some, some advice to, uh, uh, to some young folk growing up today to how precious memories are, what, what, what would you tell them? Pay attention to your history document it as much as you possibly can. You know, there's a lot of the historical facts that I have, Bobby, I have actually rescued them. A lot of people die, mm -hmm. and their kids don't see the value of keeping pictures and remnants of their family past, <laughs> and they throw it away. You know, I remember one guy, and I'm not gonna call his name, I bought a bag of pictures and in that picture was him and his mother and his brothers. And I had an exhibit set up. And he said, that's my mama. He mm. started crying. He said, that's mama. And I was able to give him that picture wow. back. Mm -hmm. you know, so I sort of like preserve you know, history. You know, and a lot, like a lot of things that I have, people didn't want them. Mm -hmm. you know, and I collect them. You know, I, like I said before, I, I've been a benefactor of your gifts. Mm -hmm. Uh, and hanging in our office is a portrait of a right. black Jesus right. uh, hanging on a cross between two thieves, and, I, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, am I missing anything, Vern, that you want to share with us that, that we, didn't, we didn't touch on? I also have a collection of obituaries, and obituaries mm -hmm. are one of the greatest sources of his, historical facts. Mm -hmm. And one of the oldest obituaries I have is from the 1940s, and it was Clarence Walker, who was the principal of Dillon High School. Mm -hmm. You know, and he went to bat so that our children would be able to go to school year round, just like everybody else. And you have his obituary. I actually have his obituary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you gave me a picture, uh, a black and white picture of a boxer. Was it a boxer? I'm trying to see. Yeah, you, you, you had it in that, and I still got it. Okay. Uh, I want to say a boxer. I don't know. Was it out? No, it was something. Anyway. But, but uh, uh, the fact that the items that you, you collect are, are, are memorabilia uh, uh, that's worthy of, of a showcase, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you treasure that. I treasure. Mm -hmm. Mazel was probably one of the greatest photographers that the world has ever seen. Mm -hmm. he took some of the greatest pictures. I got my mother's prom pictures, my uncle's prom pictures, nice, beautiful black and white mm -hmm. pictures, man, that, that tell a story about how proud and how worthy our people are, you know? And those things need to be seen. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of other people in the neighborhood who has mm -hmm. gifts like that that need to be shared mm -hmm. with our young people and our older people, mm -hmm. for that matter. And all that comes from this area called Fort, Fort Lauderdale, Lauderdale, Lauderdale Six Right, right. Sixth Street. Right, right. And let me give the real credit. The real credit, Bobby, goes to my grandmother, Mary Walker, and my mother, Oneida Doolin, mm -hmm. who has preserved, I probably have over 500 pictures of our family. I have uh, uh, my, my mother and father's uh, first bank account that they have. I have my father's first bill of sale. He had a lawn service. Mm -hmm. um, I have, I mean, I got my original driver's license from high school. It's, I don't know what my mom, she just kept it. Mm -hmm. You know, all those kind of things. I got probably one of my, my sister's first check stub mm -hmm. when she used to work for OIC. Was it OIC, OIC. or Beta? OIC. One of those oh, companies. Yeah. But my mom yeah. kept everything. I got my first grade uh, pictures. I got all my report cards from first grade through sixth grade, and they came in a little brown bag. Miss <laughs> Sands was my first grade teacher, mm -hmm. man. But my mom kept everything. Well, Mr. Doolin, I certainly appreciate, you know, the time that you spent with us and taking us back down memory lane and uh, sharing with us your artifacts and uh, family memorabilia, everyday fruit stand. Thank you. That's right. Yeah. Well, Vern, thank you very much, man. Thank you, Mr. Henry. And God bless you, bro. Giving me this platform.
this is the part of the program that I enjoy when I get a chance to say, what's up? And that's the segment of this program. So with us this, this, on this segment is a very thorough, knowledgeable servant individual who does not like to take the fame and the acclaim for what he does. But uh, Mr. Guy Anthony Wheeler is joining us on this segment of What's Up. <laughs> What's up? What's up? What's going on? It's all good, man. All right, all right. Uh, let's start off with this. Understanding the things that are happening across this country as it pertains to black people and the psychological damage we endure from what we, we uh, have uh, at the hands of those who are supposed to be protecting us. The role of a therapist is needed. Uh, how can you respond to that? What would you respond to? How would you respond to that? Uh, the first thing that I would talk about is the idea of trauma. And before you ever talk about trauma, you must talk about the historical kind of trauma. Hey, hold on, now, now what gives you the, 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 the wherewithal to be able to talk about that? Who are you? Well, basically, I'm a counselor here and been working in this field for particularly over 30 years. My focus would happen to be on mental health. And over the years, I've been working with substance abuse, so I've worked with particularly the poor, depressed, and the hungry for over 30 years of, of seeing people dealing with all kinds of multitude of issues, particularly through the crack cocaine era. And um, so that's basically uh, my background. Mm -hmm. Now I'm working, doing curriculums, doing a lot of other things mm -hmm. as well. Well, see, I, I know that, but I just okay. want the audience to understand. Gotcha. You just not, you know, I mean, no, even no. though you carry yourself as such lowly, but you're not. You, you are, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, issues of, of therapy and, 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 and intervention. You're the man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been doing uh, curriculum stuff lately, and particularly working with African American males between the ages of 19 uh, to 30, and then we did a juvenile. It's called HEAT, it's called Habilitation Empowerment Accountability Therapy. And I got that term, uh, habilitation, from a good friend of mine, Vern Doolin, who was just having a conversation one time and says, how in the world are we going to have rehabilitation and we've never got the basics parts of done? So, I think that's something that is essential, particularly working with African Americans mm -hmm. that is needed, an intervention. The weakness, particularly in African American community as it relates to mental health, has been stigma. Mm -hmm. Because we have been stigmatized to the idea of mental health going back from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So if we go all the way back to the beginning, it was said that if a slave ran away, they gave him a mental health diagnosis called Drapetomania. Drapetomania? Drapetomania. Mm -hmm. There was a term if African Americans wanted to run away for their own benefit. Mm -hmm. They said that African Americans wanted to be white, so they gave them a mental health diagnosis. So throughout time is that they have always misdiagnosed, particularly people of color, uh, i.e. Uh, schizophrenia. You know, when mm -hmm. a brother may act out or respond in a certain type of way, they've given us misdiagnosed us, particularly African Americans, as schizophrenia. So mental health has always been an issue as well as a stigma, okay, throughout the years. That's why many brothers, as well as sisters, was extremely reluctant mm -hmm. about going in and getting some help. So, so how can we address this issue in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a platform, on a platform, or in a platform that, that it doesn't seem invasive or it doesn't seem like we're, we're belittling anybody? You know, how, how can we do that? Well, I think we need to find a way to engage people, okay? And we have always tried to engage particularly people of color, okay, with a white perspective, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. what is essential, that's necessary, is called cultural responsivity. You must deal and address people based upon their culture. And once you talk to them based upon their culture, they have a better understanding. You go to talk to somebody Spanish, they want them to talk Spanish. Every other culture, every other culture wants you to embrace them from a cultural kind of perspective. Mm -hmm. But they expect particularly black people not to look at it. So here's, let me give you an example of this. Mm -hmm. What we've been trying to do, we've been trying to give pumpkin pie to people who eat sweet potato pie. Talk to me somebody. Okay, <laughs> we have been dealing with an idea of cultural, called mm -hmm. cultural acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Wait a minute, back, why, rewind that thing. Okay. Say, say it again, right. say it again. It's called CAIDS. This is something by Naeem Akba. Okay. He mm -hmm. said that once, once we lack culture, when we're dealing with particularly people of color, we have, just like you have AIDS, said the whole blood system that you don't have. So once you have culturally mm -hmm. acquired immune deficiency syndrome, you got a problem. Mm -hmm. So if you intervene with a person, 
based upon culture mm -hmm. and have a very clear understanding in them. And when you start looking at culture, particularly people of color, mm -hmm. you have to take everything into consideration. Their expressions, their walk. Let me give you an example. The little kid that got killed in Colorado. Mm -hmm. Okay, the little boy playing right. the flute with right. the birds. <clears throat> Anybody who understood culture could have looked at him, could have looked at how he walked, how he talked. There's something different culturally, mm -hmm. okay, about particularly people of color that you can have a clear understanding, that you can very understand that he was kind of a quiet, laid back, and how he talked and what he said. You would have known, like, no, 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 no. He ain't no murderer. This, this ain't no bad kid. Mm -hmm. But we don't never take it there. So my understanding is that until we do an understanding, let me give you a point. Everybody else in the world studies every other people, but we don't study black folks. So what I think is needed is that you need anthropology. Mm -hmm. When they took over Africa, guess what they did? They went and studied them for a while. Livingston went down there and oh, yeah. studied all of Africa from 1893 for the Berlin Conference. He said, well, let's go down there. Send Livingston down there. You know what Livingston went down there and did? What did he, he studied them. He studied the people. He hung out with them for a long period okay. of time. And after he studied them, he said, whoa, we know them. We're, we now know their customs. We know what they eat. We know what they think. We know culture. Mm -hmm. They understood culture. But why don't we do that with African-American people? So until we come up with positive, okay, from a cultural kind of perspective and talk to people of color, there's no way that I could talk to somebody in the same vein of a lot of stuff I've learned in graduate school. Let me give you a simple example. Mm -hmm. I learned in graduate school that if you talk with somebody, there's called Gestalt therapy. Right. Gestalt therapy is that you know uh, uh, you can deal in with them kind of issues of hurt and pain. So here's what I did. Here I was going to graduate school, right? And while I was in graduate school, they talked about you know put somebody in a chair and let them talk to the chair. Mm -hmm. Right. So you know I'm over there. I'm working over at Bark at the time, and this guy's mama died. Right. So I'm learning in school. Said, so, man, you know, put, put him chair, in the chair. Put him, put, put him in the chair. Yeah, and talk to the chair. chair on the other side. Mm -hmm. Let him talk to the chair. Now my culture said, you know, what the heck, God, but, but I was taught that this right. is what to do. Right. Now right. I'm getting an education. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get a degree or indoctrinated, one or the other. Okay. I don't know. If I was getting okay. educated or indoctrinated. Okay. Might have been mm -hmm. indoctrinated, but I'm gonna leave that alone. So I tried it. I put the brother on the other side of the. I put the I put a chair over here and I sat down right. I mean, let the brother sit down right here. I said, "Well, brother, go on here and talk to your your your, your grandma over there." Mm -hmm. And he looked around the room. He looked around the room and said, "Oh, Mr. Will." I said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." I said, "Well, man, this is how to do it. You got to talk to your mama and those over in the chair." And it was an empty chair. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget this. He looked at me like. Uh, excuse my expression, he said, Mr. Will, I don't do no shit. Do no shit. I mean, sh you know, I'm like, yeah. whoa. whoa. But I thought I was right. The book. The book told me how to do it this way. Absent of culture. Yeah, yeah. I, well, there was no culture in it. And I, mm -hmm. I, I knew that I was right. Mm -hmm. I know I was like, damn, it taught me this. Right. And the guy looked at me like, no, uh, Mr. Will, we don't do mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought I know better. Yeah. But I was being indoctrinated, so I had to recognize is that if we were going to work particularly with people of color, even from a mental health, from a substance abuse, you have to address them from culture. I got you. Culture is crucial. I got you. You know, and, and, and this, this, this conversation uh, begs to go deeper. Oh, no question. You know, and, 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 and understanding that the lack of, of being able to talk culturally to an individual no creates a whole bunch of okay let me okay let's let's just deal with um, um, what's happening right now mm -hmm. you know all of this all of this police you know uh, mm -hmm. uh, whatever what what could you offer uh, uh, the police department or sheriff department law enforcement what could you offer them to uh, better address uh, the situation. Interesting. I got a call about that today. And I told him the same thing that I'm saying. I says, until y'all understand people of color, mm -hmm. right, when the police deal with black people, right, until they understand them from a cultural perspective, it's going to always be a problem. Mm -hmm. The first problem with most police officers when they deal with black males, they're scared of them. Mm -hmm. But guess what? From a cultural perspective, we as black people were taught when we were young, boy, don't you, don't you never, mm -hmm. okay? Leave them police long, and you better not never shoot at no police or kill a police because you ain't going to never come out of there. So culturally, we were already taught. So we ain't going to kill no police. We ain't going to shoot at no police. And unfortunately, we'll kill, our, we'll kill somebody else, okay, before we shoot at the police. That's culture. So when police officers see somebody black in the car is, they don't realize that that brother is just as afraid, okay, as the police officer. Because we were taught is, hey, don't mess with them police because they'll kill you. They'll beat you up. 
that's why culture is essential and I think it's necessary. Okay. Uh, and Mr. Wheeler, I, I, I understand that this is just a short segment, yeah. but I, I really appreciate the conversation, the re-enlightenment of just how, 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 how important our culture is, mm -hmm. not only to ourselves, but to others. So if I can, if I can invite you back again, and let's, let's have a further discussion on this matter. Get more in depth. Okay, thank you, brother, from a culturally perspective. <laughs> Be great. Be great, man, for real. <laughs>